So there I was, on the march, with a sheep and a pig and a chicken and a message. And all I could think about was how did it come to this? I was supposed to be making a programme about disgusting meat. Hello, man. But let me tell you, it was a journey involving, amongst other things, a load of chicken skin. Oh, jeez. A rather peeved Chef Ramsay. These Australian lamb shanks that you said were shit in a bag, they're on sale at Booker. They're on sale at Booker at the moment, and is the other face of Booker. A fish. It worked! They couldn't Yo! keep away from the flesh! Look at this! Some meat-making machinery. He just wants to know a bit more about the process, how it works, how... ...that I wasn't allowed to see. Some young ladies in bat bikinis. Whoa! Look at me! Oh Look my at me! Look at me! Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> nice baps. <laughs> and a whole load of techniques our food manufacturers use to put far less meat and far more crap into their products. And how they get away with slipping in the bits of animal that you probably don't want to be eating. But anyway, I now had a message for the Food Standards Agency. Um, we can't write shit. What? We're not allowed to write shit. Why not? We're the BBC, you're expected to maintain certain that's, standards. That's what, you know, that's the, that's the point we're making. You know, by eating this shit, you can save animals. Last year, as the BBC's resident connoisseur of crap, I made a programme about Britain's really disgusting food and created my own pie brand, Mr Riley's. It's Mr Riley's pie! There's always a big surprise in Mr Riley's pies. <laughs> I'd become the proud daddy of a pie filled with a little meat and a lot of other stuff, like pigskin, connective tissue and hydrogenated fat. Disgusting, yes, but it tasted OK, and it was very, very cheap. It also whetted my appetite to dig a bit deeper into the food business. Microwavable mixed grill. And where better Lovely. to start than meat? I wanted to find out how low manufacturers were prepared to go without breaking the law. I decided to begin with Britain's favourite fast food, the beef burger. What I was looking for was the secret of how to make a burger as cheaply as possible, which probably meant using as little beef as possible. Well, four beef quarter pounders for a quid, 73% beef, 10% onion. The supermarkets appeared to have become super worthy by putting loads of beef in their burgers. So I turned to the cash and carries, suppliers of the burgers you might find in your local burger van, chip shop or cafe, where you'll never get to see a list of ingredients. And it was in best ways, cash and carry, that I struck gold. Butler's Burgers. Mm. Beef, 47%. Beef hearts, 21%. This is uh, worthy of further investigation. I had my inspiration, a burger that was less than 50% meat, which was possibly the reason for each burger in the box costing me only 17p. All I needed now was someone to tell me how they managed to stretch one cow between as many burgers as possible. That man was Richard Guy from The Real Meat Company, a cow-rearing visionary. They've been interesting with the terminology here. By putting the word economy in between seasoned and burgers, they can roll all the way down to 47%, less than half. Um, if you're going to call a beef burger a beef burger, it's actually going to have 62% in it, which still ain't what I'd call a beef burger, but in European law, that you can get away with. So hang on, 47% then, so that is the legal minimum that, you, is. that you can do. And these guys are skimming right on it. You know, in a way, these are very clever people. They have managed to create a burger that's right at the legal limit. So, if you've been making your beef burgers to the letter of the law and using 62% beef, stop right there. Because the FSA, our Food Standards Agency, have decreed that by just inserting the magic word economy, you can drop the beef percentage right down to 47%. Of course, that leaves you having to make over half your burger out of other things. 
What's interesting to me is the fact that uh, the second largest ingredient is beef heart, 21%. Yeah. Why would they go to all the trouble of getting the beef content down to 47% and then go and put 21% beef heart in there? Well, because they're cheap chips, really. I mean, you're then down to something that's almost a waste product. I mean, beef hearts aren't widely sold. I don't think you'd see one in a supermarket. So, you know, they're almost dumped um, onto the open market. Nothing wrong with eating beef hearts, but would you go home and say, let's make some beef burgers? I know, I must go and get a beef heart. But, you know, it's not what you do. Well, if your name was Mr Riley, that's exactly what you'd do. Richard was going to help me create my own economy burger, inspired by the ingredients listed on the Batley's Economy Burger box. Is this beef? Yeah, this is uh, beef tail. Mm. Oh, is that tripe? Oh, okay, that looks horrible. Tripe. First, we needed to get hold of that vital cow ingredient, the heart. Look at the size of it. Yeah, it's, it's all protein with a little bit of fat on the outside. An unhealthy cow. Looks perfect. Obviously, my burger was not going to be only heart. We did have to use some other bits of the cow. Any old beef will do for what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. What's this thing here? It's got a nose. A nose. Oh, it's a nose. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, we'll take that then. And do you have any actual beef fat on its own? Just fat. Yeah, can we have some of that as well? That's it there. <laughs> do you usually sell beef fat? It's, it's rubbish, isn't it, really? Yeah. Probably just throw it in. Yeah. So, uh, but we'll have it. Where's the ton, this? I'll tell you what, we're going to do a lot of burgers out of this mixture. Oh, It was time to reverse engineer a burger for Mr. Riley. Richard had an inn, in a posh butcher's. Very posh. Well, I'll actually have to make a phone call to see if you can put cow nose in. Uh, I don't know what part of the animal that counts in. Can you put a cow's nose in a burger? Is that beef? Definitely not. Mm. Don't despair if you've already rushed out and purchased a cow's nose. If you remove its hairs by waxing or shaving, you might find a place for it in some sort of a stew. Luckily for me, my cow's nose was attached to my cow's cheeks, and they were fine to put in a burger. It's a little bit there. Uh, cheeks. Well, cow's cheeks. Cheek meat's allowed. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's good. Put that in. Uh, heart. Yeah, that's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's like any heart. Yeah. It's just a muscle. Oh, look at that, look at that. Oh, it's like a banjo. I bet that's a bit uh, chewy. Of the meat we put in, we can include within that meat 25% fat, and then we can add fat in after as well. That's lovely, lovely wine. Mm -hmm. It's saturated fat. Now, seeing as this is a programme about meat, well, meat and fat and heart and things, I won't bore you with the rest. Suffice it to say that we also had to add a load of rusk to bulk it out and a fair sprinkling of chemicals to make it stick together and last a long time. It's yet another one to delay the rancidity of the fat. Mince! Yeah, look at the fat. OK, so the moment of truth, chaps. Should we do the medium? I should do pretty well done, actually. I should point out that the reason my creation has disintegrated is because I hadn't chilled it before cooking to allow it to set. Look at that. That's what I like to do with a burger, like make it into a sort of a mince meat. A surprise. But you'll get the taste of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there we go. Horrible. It's gooey, isn't it? Horrible. Oh, not that bad. It struck me that when we eat economy burgers like these beauties, we never get to appreciate their genius because we've no idea what's in them. I decided to take my own Batley's inspired economy burgers to the street and reveal all. And I got in Scott, a food expert fellow, to make sure they didn't fall apart this time. Look at that meaty goodness. I was in the mood for something. Hadn't tasted. Hi there. Would, Hi, uh, do you want to come and try some uh, barely legal burgers? Well, it's 47% beef. Oh, that's too big right there. And what's the other? What's the other? 50? Well, it, you know, water and uh, rusk. rusk. And it's 21% beef heart. <laughs> oh, wicked. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> It didn't take many burgers or many cow hearts before I was ready to draw some conclusions. By and large, people have, have liked the taste of the burger. I've had, I had cheap testicles in Mongolia and they weren't very nice. But... Try. You could do it. 
I liked it. I don't know if that's the uh, the booze talking, but uh, they like the taste. They think it's quite a, a meaty taste. How does it rank with other burgers you've eaten? Just, I've, just, I've had a few beers. I've got to say, it went down wicked. The beef heart has been a little bit controversial. Yeah. That was in it. Yeah. What do you think about heart? Would you would you normally no, eat a heart? No, I knew it was part before when I've eaten it. Some people said, yeah, well, you know, it's part of a cow. I, I understand the point, you know, but no, no, it I, it, to me, it doesn't make it less attractive. Well, that's good. That's good. Because I'm, I'm a meat eater. Others have spat it out. The secret ingredient is beef heart. Mm. What do you think? Ah, mm. oh. cheers, mate. <laughs> or run off screaming. Oh, my God. Are you happy with that? What? She, she wasn't happy with that, was she? But, you know, won't do her any harm. They're totally legal. Just. The truth was, most people seemed to quite like my barely legal burgers, at least until they found out what was in them. I had to accept that advertising the ingredients was never going to work, but I was determined Batley's economy burgers didn't go uncelebrated. Oh, shit. Pull it too tight. I thought if Batley's Economy Burgers announced themselves as barely legal, they'd get the recognition they deserved. So, I devised them a marketing strategy. Look at this. Look at this. What do you think? Barely legal burgers. Look at my BAPs. These are the BAPs for a barely... I've not worked out the exact way of saying it yet, but this is a very significant part of the campaign. My oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> nice baps. <laughs> yes, great. Uh, you are 18, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. I am over 18. Over 18, good. Uh, yeah, because. Uh, oh, I've just lost, lost my thread. But I was going to say, looking good, shall we crack on yeah, to yeah. the burger place? Right, let's go. Great, come on then. What we're doing is we're going to uh, this big cash and carry company that sell these burgers and we're coming up with a new advertising campaign because they are on the legal limit of how much beef you can put in. We're saying, you know, shout about it. Make it into an asset. Don't, don't hide it. Let's say these are barely legal burgers. <laughs> that way they seem more edgy, they seem more exciting. It's sort of like, yeah, ooh, it's a bit naughty, isn't it? It's a bit naughty. And when we get there, part of the advertising is a song. So let me, let me teach it to you. Batley's economy, burgers are barely illegal. Batley's economy, burgers are a barely legal treat. They're a cheeky mealtime treat, a cheeky mealtime treat. If you're not that keen on beef and want an organ between your teeth. <laughs> They're a cheeky mealtime, but it is an organ, it's the heart which is an organ. Yes. Oh gosh, I can't believe that. Yeah, 21% mm. beef heart. Would you like, would you eat a burger like that? No. Yeah. We'd arrived at Bestway, not only the place where you can buy the Batley's Economy Burger, but the actual company which owns Batley's itself. The lawyers wish me to point out once more that these Economy Burgers are legal and do comply with food standards regulations. Me, I thought barely legal had that covered, but anyway, I've said it now. Who would like a free lunch? Batley's Economy Burgers, uh, a tasty mealtime treat. Batley's barely legal burgers, edgy, dangerous, different. In fact, we've got a song. Batley's Economy Burgers are barely legal. Batley's Economy Burgers are a tasty legal treat. A cheeky lunchtime treat, a cheeky mealtime treat. If you're not that keen on beef or what it is. Batley's up your history. It's, a, it's work in progress. Uh, it's going well. Best way, come and speak to me. I have the answer to your burger promotional needs. The Batley's Economy Beef Burger is barely legal. We take our hats off to you, but why not shout it from the rooftops? Batley's barely legal burgers. Sounds a little bit naughty, doesn't it? And the young people up and down the land, they're rebellious, they want to look like they're a bit cool. Hey, you, what are you eating that burger for? It's 100% beef, that's rubbish. 
get one of these. It's barely legal because I'm a bit of a nutter. I mean, you could rewrite the song. You could do one a bit more. <coughs> when I get a burger, I want it to be barely legal. <coughs> see, see where I'm going with that? Yeah. Hello. Hi there. Alex Riley from the BBC. We're, uh, we're basically doing an advertising campaign for the Economy Beef Burger. Do you have authorisation to do this? We've sp spoken to the PR person, but... And he's given you okay to well, do he, this? Well, no, he, he, he said he couldn't set something up, so we thought we'd just come down and, and just have a chat about it, basically. But we're saying that, you know, it's 47% beef, which is the legal minimum. It's something to be proud of. Sorry. It's the barely legal burger. Sorry, Are you sure? This is, all right, thanks very much. Blimey, Nick. You must be freezing. It's kind of cold. <laughs> Let's have a group hug. While you look at some completely irrelevant cows wandering through a quiet housing estate, let me read you the message Bestway sent me. Our research confirms that there are beef burger products with the same and also with less beef content available legally in the UK. The product in question represents about 7% of its manufacturer's production run of products with the same specification and is popular with caterers, including burger vans, who are looking to provide food to consumers at a certain price point. They also said their economy burgers contain more beef than what's printed on the box. Now, I don't want to be pedantic, but let me assure you I'd been to every major supermarket and the top five cash and carries, and there was no burger to compare. I was back on the lookout for more disgusting meat when I happened to get a steer from Chef Ramsay. What in the fuck is inside the lamb shank? And how long has that been cooked for? For a dish never to be refrigerated? That's all chemical, isn't it? Chef Ramsay was getting very irate about some Australian lamb shanks. They appeared to be a clever way of passing off cheap cuts of meat as a gourmet meal and contained a fair few chemicals. Do you feel like having a shit? Thank fuck I didn't eat it. Sugar flavourings, colour, E, 150D, fuck me. I'm surprised you haven't fucking killed off half the population in Oakhampton. Chef Ramsay had even coined a neat phrase for this phenomenon. Shit in a plastic bag. When you bought that shit in a plastic bag, you tried to... Mr Riley had a new inspiration. Gastropub favourite, the lamb shank. As a cut, the shank is cheap, and coming from a tough muscled area, it requires a lengthy period of cooking to avoid it being completely inedible. But these Australian babies can be microwaved in just nine minutes and can sit in a box for a year without refrigeration. Brilliant! I had a tip-off that Australian lamb shanks were on sale at a popular cash and carry. The reason that it wasn't me going in was because me and Booker had history. Got permission to film. I've got permission to wear the suit. Have you got permission to film? No, no, no. In my last programme, I'd come up with an idea to help Booker promote their rather watery chicken breasts, but it hadn't gone according to plan. Now, I wasn't really welcome. Oh, look at this. Australian lamb shanks. With Australian lamb shanks in my accomplice's undercover hand, the next step was obvious. A trip to see Ian, my local food technologist. A well-known television chef put us onto these. And the brilliant thing about this is the shelf life. Look at this. One year, and you don't actually have to put it in the freezer or no, even the no, fridge. Um, it's room temperature, yeah. leave that. Mm -hmm. A year later, yeah. put it in the microwave. Bob's uncle. It's the wonders of technology. They cook it till it's more or less sterile, add the necessary preservatives, so, yes. and any flavour that may have been lost in the processing, you are allowed to put back in. That's a flavour enhancer so that's, that's a, used especially for me, A631. So basically, the, the, the process to actually make this sterile so yes. that it lasts forever yes. is going to take the flavour out of it. Oh yeah, but you're allowed legally to put the flavour back in. Yeah. It's falling away from the bone. Probably here in this country, we'd say that was technology going too far. But those, uh, those Aussies, bless them, you know, they've, they've, they've pushed it to the limit. Very good. It seemed perfectly right for Chef Ramsay to take against the Australian lamb shank. But then I remembered something about the place it was being sold. I've opened the catalogue for Booker, and who should be in the front but celebrity chef Mr Gordon Ramsay. Not only was Gordon in last year's Booker catalogue, Gordon Ramsay Holdings had a consultancy agreement with Booker. 
with Chef Ramsay not having the best of times in the paper and before anyone had the temerity to accuse him of hypocrisy, I thought I'd better let him know he could be on the verge of another PR disaster. I called his people. It's Alex Riley here from the BBC um, and I'd like to uh, speak to Gordon Ramsay, please. Well, he's actually out of the country at the moment. I've got something that I need to uh, tell him, basically, and uh, I think he'd be rather interested to hear it. If you can pass on a message, uh, it's, re it's regarding... Um, I don't know how to say this, really. Uh, shit in a bag. I th he'll know what I'm talking about. Shit in a bag, Yes, okay. I'm sure you're used to bad language working for, for Gordon Ramsay. Little shocks me. <laughs> uh, OK, shit in a bag. He'll, he'll, he'll know what I mean. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Right, so uh, she's passing it on to her boss, who um, deals with Gordon Ramsay stuff, and uh, she's going to give us a ring back, apparently. But he's out of the country, and this uh, shit-in-a-bag story could blow up in his face. I couldn't hang around waiting for Gordon, so I decided to turn my attention to the cheap end of the chicken business. And where better to start? than a huge international food expo in London. Now, as you might imagine, a meeting of the world's chicken folk wasn't that exciting, so I won't make you sit through it. But what I did find out was that one of the main ways to make a cheap chicken product is to get your chicken from abroad. Eastern Europe now is becoming a, a, you know, a major player. There's more product now coming out of Poland and Hungary. And again, you've, you've also got your Brazil, your Thailand. But cheap foreign chicken comes at a price. It's cheap, but it's not particularly great. Really? Any of this chicken in here, I'd be happy to eat. Anything from the Eastern Bloc, Holland, wherever, I'm not that keen. Is it, is it because of what they've, what they've sort of pumped into it, or...? Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day. But for cheap food manufacturers, this chicken is perfect, and a kind of miracle when you know what it's been through. That's right, it's cheaper to raise a chicken somewhere like Brazil, feed it up, kill it, salt it, freeze it, ship it to Holland, defrost it, desalt it, inject water into it via dozens of needles, tumble it in a giant cement mixer-like machine until the water has been absorbed, refreeze it, and then ship it to Britain for processing into some sort of chicken-filled shaped product. And why is it cheaper? because salted meat attracts only a fraction of the EU tax applied to fresh meat, and that's why we end up importing zillions of tonnes of it every year. I went off to trawl all the main supermarkets. I got down to 47% meat in my beef burger by inserting the word economy. I wanted to find out just how far I could stretch a chicken. Chicken Kievs. And there I stumbled upon a perfect chicken vehicle. Britain's first ever ready meal, the chicken Kiev. Yeah, I love them. <laughs> oh, look at one of these. The least chickeny Kiev I could find was the Tesco's Value Kiev, weighing in at just 32% chicken. If you think that sounds okay, pay attention to the nice lady who'll tell you how it should be made. I need to first of all pull the skin off the chicken breast and then cut the chicken breast. Ooh, that looks horrible. Place. The garlic butter. That's just minced. That's awful. Fold the chicken breast back over. You can even place the little fillet in there so you don't waste it. I don't see any evidence of any white chicken there. No. So it could come from any part of the chicken body. Place the breaded chicken into the hot pan. It just has none of the characteristics of chicken as we know it. I want to show you what it looks like. Yeah. So there is the gorgeous chicken Kiev. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not going to eat that at all. No. I'm sure it's not going to harm you in the slightest, except that no. it does nothing for me from a, an organoleptic point of view. Shall Come we again? From a sensorial point of view. Okay. I'd learned two things, a new word and that I should go and talk to Tesco. Tesco didn't want to talk to me, but they sent me an email. Chicken Kiev is a dish consisting of many ingredients, including chicken, a seasoned butter filling and breadcrumbs, so the amount of poultry will vary from recipe to recipe. We produce a range of chicken Kievs from value to finest to high standards and to suit all tastes and pockets. They are clearly labelled with ingredients so that customers can make an informed choice. I had a sneaky feeling that the customers opting for less than a third chicken in their Kievs were probably broke. 
At Sheffield Hallam University, I had some students ready to help Mr Riley find out just how far we could push the Kiev while remaining within the regulations of our food standards agency. This is chicken trim, which has been taken off the carcass after the uh, breast meat's been removed. So look at that. That is the amount of chicken that we're going to put into 12 Kievs. You've got your skin. Does the chicken skin help it stick together? Does it... Uh, help it feel firmer? Are there any are there any sort of technical advantages to the skin or that no. helps? No. no. Okay, but the, some financial ones. The chicken fat. Oh, jeez. Oh, it is, it's and, so I mean, it has got slimy, a little bit of, isn't it? Yeah, which so you'd slippery. expect. It's also got some, you know, connective tissues in there. And this is the soya flour. So that's going to help it bind. When you cook it, let less water and fat will just sort of run out of it. I soon had a combination of cheap chicken bits, rusk, chemicals and water. Lovely, isn't it? I mean, it does, I mean, it looks very appetising now, I think. Nice and gently. A few finishing touches later, and Mr Riley had his very own chicken Kiev, using a very chicken-friendly world record of only 10% chicken meat. But was it legal? I needed a food labelling advisor, and luckily there was one called Jamie just around the corner. I've got this uh, chicken Kiev, and the, the biggest ingredient is chicken skin. The actual amount of chicken meat constitutes only 10% of the overall product. Can I actually call it a chicken Kiev? You can, and the, the main reason for that is chicken Kiev isn't one of the terms that is legally controlled in terms of a min minimum amount of meat. Really? So maybe I've, got, I've put too much chicken in it. Well, you, you've, got, you've, you've got to make sure that the product that you're producing would not mislead the consumer and it would be what an average consumer would expect a chicken Kiev to be. But, I mean, if this only had 1% chicken in it, but it had garlic, butter and it had breadcrumbs, would it, could I still call it a chicken Kiev? I think you'd be pushing the boundaries there. Thanks to the Food Standard Agency's lack of chicken Kiev regulations, I now had a product with only 10% chicken. Or did I? I knew I'd only put 10% actual meat into my Kiev, but regulations allow a certain amount of chicken skin, fat and connective tissue to also be counted as meat. Jamie put my ingredients into his computer to work out what percentage of meat I could legally claim on the label, according to FSA guidelines. The actual meat content did actually increase to about 19%. We've almost doubled the meat content via putting it into your computer. Yeah. That's fantastic, that. Thank you. I'm sure, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that will uh, help us uh, push this to uh, unsuspecting consumers. <laughs> <laughs> Within the letter of the law. At the push of a button, I transformed skin, fat and connective tissue into chicken meat. It was time to take Mr Riley's Chicken Kiev to visit some professional eaters. For the purposes of good experimentation and to prove that the students could cook nice food, they made a comparison Kiev from 100% minced chicken breast. Now obviously mine was actually four times as bad for you, but then it could be sold for a quarter of the price, if anyone could stomach it. In a sensory chamber tinted green to prevent visual stimuli affecting the result, the Kievs were rated on appearance, aroma and taste. Then personal emotive feedback was sought. It was soon clear from the handy colour coding of blue for good and red for bad that both Kievs had issues. No chicken smell, bland. And that even trained palates don't agree on everything. No garlic. Too much garlic. Bring on the acceptability graphic. Texture. Aroma. Flavour. Appearance. I won that one. Overall. And guess what? You all, ten of you, prefer the premium product. <laughs> <laughs> so, well done. But before you sell your shares in Mr Riley, let's remove the premium product from our graphic. On balance, when we look at the actual scores, it's not like it's unacceptable. No. It's it's you know, slightly acceptable, so it sort of can pass. Yeah. Mr. Riley had come up with a slightly acceptable but completely legal chicken Kiev with 19%. Well, really 10% chicken. But before I could get my Kiev to market, something came up. 
Chef Ramsay was back in town, and this was my chance to warn him that Booker, a company he promoted, was selling the very lamb shanks that he'd called shit in a bag. They were just around the corner, behind Waterstones on Piccadilly, uh, where Gordon is supposed to be doing a book signing. I've got my Australian lamb shanks here, and I'm hoping to be able to get to him and warn him that Booker is selling these lamb shanks. You know, we're just trying to help. Hopefully, he'll take what I've got to say in, in good part. And I know he spares a lot, but I don't think he's necessarily a violent man. I bloody hope not. Um, so we're just going to, I'm just going to say what I've got to say and, and hope that he can save himself from more embarrassment. Ooh, that could be the car parking space for his uh, limo. So maybe we're in the best position. Is this, this could be it. This could be it. Is this, is this it? Is this him? Gordon. Gordon. Alex Riley from the BBC. These Australian lamb shanks that you said were shit in a bag. They're on sale at Booker. They're on sale at Booker at the moment. And as you're the face of Booker, two, two, two just, seconds, just can we just, saying. Can we just clarify one thing. What? First of all, I'm not the face of Booker. Okay. So what do but you, you work for them, don't you? You do, so you no, do some work promotion for them, for them. No, I don't. Um, I'm, Clearly, um, we're live. Um, I'd really appreciate if you got your facts right. As we weren't actually live, I might as well let you know when Chef Ramsay's fact-correcting was, in fact, incorrect. Let me just explain. Yeah. When I first came across them, they weren't yeah. even allowed to go in the refrigeration unit. Yeah, the lamb no, no, the temperature. Room temperature, yeah, that's and right. And it was lamb that was sourced from New Zealand. That's Chef Ramsay's first fact-correcting error. I had the box, and it was from Australia, not New Zealand. My embarrassment was the fact that, how can you call that freshly cooked... OK, that uh, doesn't well, even sit... Exactly. Can I just finish my sentence, please? Yeah. doesn't even sit in a fridge, yeah. 365 days out on the floor, exactly. and you're charging £15 for it and yeah. calling it local lamb from New Zealand. I've done the Australia thing, and maybe it's a bit petty to point out that it was being sold for £11, not 15 But I'm sure Gordon wasn't just on about the wording of the menu, but the lamb having enough chemicals to kill off half of Oakhampton. Let's just get one thing incredibly clear. Yeah. I am not the face of Booker. Not the face of Booker. We'd better come back to that one. I don't okay. have a range of food in there. But you're so in their you're brochure. Factually, you're factually incorrect. I'm not in their brochure and I'm not representing them. Yeah, I'd better come back to that one. But do you, I mean, they are selling it. I just so you know, I mean, okay, you probably well, weren't aware of that. That's all I'm, I'm saying. I'm totally is... aware of the fact they are selling it. Oh, really? Okay. That's got nothing to do with me whatsoever. Okay, but that's I fine. Think... Well, that's good, that's great. Well, Thank you so just much. so you know. Not in the brochure. At least that should be easy to check. I went to find out. The brochure at the time was for spring 2009. We've just got the Booker catalogue here and I'm just going to check. Oh, hello. Uh, entire colour. Plain speaking with Gordon Ramsay. Oh, page 61. Saving money in a tough climate. Gordon Ramsay takes us through some of his top money saving advice. Well, you know, certainly looks like Gordon Ramsay to me. Uh, catering recipes by Gordon Ramsay. There's one there, smoked salmon and horseradish cream tartlets. Another one here, white onion soup with mature cheddar by Gordon Ramsay. And there's a, there's a photograph of, of Gordon, uh, or somebody who looks very much like Gordon, up there in the top right-hand corner on each of those nine recipes. If it's not him, then, then who, the, who on earth is it? I mean, what's it going to feel like when he finds out that somebody's been passing themselves off as Gordon Ramsay in the Booker catalogue, and it's not actually Gordon Ramsay? Ooh. I'll tell you what, I'll have a look on the website. The same mysterious Gordon lookalikey seemed to be plastered all over the Booker website, with his name and the name of Booker appearing very close together. But then the summer 2009 brochure came out, and the Gordon lookalikey had vanished, and he was gone from the website. I thought I'd better find out what had been going on. Basically, I think somebody might be impersonating Gordon. So what's he implying? Well, I'm just saying that he's said to me that he's definitely not in the brochure. I've got the brochure. He, he's definitely in it. Not so... in the current brochure at the moment. He's not in the brochure. The, the, the relationship that he had with Booker is, is um, at the moment, is sort of on hold. But at the time I was speaking to him, he, he was in the brochure, and I just wondered, you know, if it's not him, is it somebody else? Don't be ridiculous. You know, he might get, he might get quite angry. At the time that he spoke to you, what he said was absolutely correct. He wasn't. I mean, there might be... Well, he was the current brochure, to be honest. I mean, it, well, how I'm, long did the brochure run for? I don't well, know, spring 2009. Well, that's, you know, quite a long period of time. In the it's just that he, he seemed like he didn't, he didn't know anything about his association with Booker. I just thought it was, it no, was thought, unusual that he didn't about, know about it. You know, the point but it's his face. What he was trying to make was trying to sort of, you know, 
know, set him up a little bit for being something of a hypocrite. I think that was what, you know, he was re responding to that. So I think at the time that he spoke to you, he was aware of the fact that his current relationship with Booker was on hold at that point. OK, thank you very much for your time. Right, bye. Thank you, bye-bye. So, Gordon had put his relationship with Booker into a holding pattern and for the time being will not be in the brochure. I'm sure that's absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with my discovery of the lamb shank for Argo. I returned to the shops. Thanks to the Food Standards Agency computer, my 10% chicken Kiev had been reclassified as containing 19% chicken. Now I was back on the lookout for a meaty product containing even less meat. Nice. There's more chicken than pork in a hot dog. Why is it chicken? I think that's, that's naughty. That's naughty. I, I don't think people expect chicken in a hot dog. But the legislation doesn't say what kind of meat that there has to be. Because it wouldn't. Because those words hot dog... Could mean anything. Could, could mean, could mean anything. Could mean carte Absolutely. As well as the cunning use of the word dog to allow the use of any old animal, my hot dogs also contained a magic ingredient that let them contain even less lean meat. It was called MRM, and it stood for Mechanically Recovered Meat. <coughs> Look at these ones. You've got to say this is a triumph of food engineering, because it's mainly water, and then in terms of meat content, there's 36% mechanically recovered chicken and 6% pork. It's legal, but I think I still think it's deceiving the, cust the, the customer. I don't think... People buying something like that would expect to get some kind of processed, reclaimed, you know, minced up chicken. To reclaim meat, take an animal, cut all the good bits off, place the remainder in a big machine and ram against a mesh, leaving the bones on one side and some meaty slurry on the other. A few years ago, it was decided that this process so drastically altered the cellular structure of the animal that what came out was no longer allowed to be called meat. It had to be called Mechanically Recovered Meat, MRM. That's what Alan, an analyst working to ensure our health and safety in relation to food, told me. It's the traces of meat that can't be easily butchered off. Plus you've got quite a bit of sinew and gristle and rind and things in there as well, which when it's subjected to the pressure in the machines, it actually flows away as a slurry. So it's just sort of jelly bits and dangly bits and sort of like pink... Well, I, I see where you're coming from, yes. I honestly believe the public have no idea what goes into a lot of their food, and I think if they knew exactly what MRM was and what sort of product it was going into, I think they would have a little bit of concern there and be much more conscientious about reading labels. It's like hot dogs here. These hot dogs are mechanically recovered chicken, water, pork fat, pork collagen... Is that, is that ground out for the bones? Pork no, the collagen. collagen is the connective tissue, it's the sinew and the... Right. So basically that is just MRM with fat. And some connective tissue, some which connective is the... Tissue. Uh, Give it a bit of bite. A bit of bite, yes. There's no meat in that at all. There's no meat in this at all. Hot dogs in brine. They're totally meat-free. Um, <laughs> vegetarians, come on. Meet me halfway. It was the holy grail. Hot dogs obviously weren't dog, they were chicken. And I had found some that weren't 50%, they weren't 40, they weren't 30, they weren't 20, they weren't 10. They were a meat product with precisely 0% meat. Set off the graphical fireworks. If Mr Riley was going to enter the world of MRM, I wanted to see it being produced. And let me assure you, I didn't just simply sit down in front of YouTube. I'd got into contact with meat processing people all over Europe. Miso mechanicni odzikivani. But no luck. Even the PR man for one of the companies that makes meat recovery machines wasn't keen on me seeing his machine in action. What is in it for us, so to speak? It is something that uh, we eat on a, on a regular basis. Well, OK, maybe if you're eating hot dogs. I can't remember ever eating a hot dog. I wouldn't touch it. Why wouldn't you have a hot dog? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't you have a hot dog? Because I don't like what goes in there. Why don't people want us to film it being produced? I don't know if you've ever been in an abattoir. No. It's the most horrible sight you can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. It's awful. You know, mechanically recovered meat. I mean, it's not going to be as graphically horrible as an abattoir. I think it is, effectively. How could it look good to take bones and put it in a press and uh, squeeze the meat off it? It just doesn't 
doesn't look good. Hmm. I travelled all the way to Cologne, where the makers of meat machinery were putting on a show. I'd even gone to the trouble of getting some pork bones so they could do me a demo. But they weren't too keen on me getting anywhere near their machines. Can you just explain how, how the machines work and that sort of thing? Can you please shut up the cover? Why, didn't you? why, don't, you, why don't you want us to, to film? What? What? No. Are you a customer? You want to buy a machine? No, no, but I might want to use one for the purposes of, uh, of what we're doing. It'd be nice. I've got some, I've got some meat with me. Yeah, that I'd like to in my bag. Okay, good. There's some pork. Yeah, uh, very good. Pork uh, with bones and stuff in it. He just wanted to know a bit more about the process, how it works, how. You don't do. No, wait, 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 wait. And that wasn't even a meat recovery machine. It was a meat desinuing machine that wasn't as bad because it produces something still allowed to be called meat. But we couldn't even film that. What a waste. What a dreadful waste of meat. So that's why I ended up in front of YouTube. <sighs> okay, okay. Oh, here we go. Here's the machine. It's popping. It's popping the bones in. Oh, jeez, that's. Oh, it's just plopping out into the tub. Ah, oh, it, it, I mean, it's the consistency and the appearance of uh, dog turds. You would never guess that was meat in any form. Look at that. Oh. The It's Not Actually Meat Animal Waste, MRM, was clearly an inspired way to fill up a meat product without using any actual meat. But with the MRM men cold shouldering me, I was going to have to reuse some MRM that had already been recovered, and I found the perfect stuff. Celebrity meatloaf, that looks absolutely gorgeous, doesn't it? Mechanically recovered pork, a treat to eat, apparently. Solid fish. nourishment. Oh, cubes of fat with a um, with a pink emulsion of meat products around it, mm -hmm. and a few bubbles. Do you find that um, acceptable to your palate? No. But with just a bit of work on the internet, I'd managed to find some celebrity meatloaf fans. I'm just off to meet them now to find out what it is they like about it. Really, I'll be surprised. I think it tastes horrible. But, uh, you know, there's no accounting for taste. At this point, I should probably clear up any misconception that this pocket of fans is human. Of course not. They're fish. In internet chat rooms worldwide, celebrity meatloaf is fast becoming the buzzword in bait. Although not, apparently, in Milton Keynes. The fishermen I stumbled upon were, in fact, celebrity meatloaf virgins. Are they biting? No. No. <laughs> well, what are you fishing on? Um, maggots on one rod, spam on the other rod. Now, we, we, I've been on a couple of websites. I found that uh, celebrity meatloaf is quite popular with uh, anglers. Would you like <laughs> to uh, dangle it in front of a few fish, see what they think? I'll try. Watch out, fish, because the celebrity meatloaf is coming to get you. By the power of television, we jump forward two hours. What do you think? What do you reckon to that? It's got an aftertaste. That isn't very good. But we're not, we're not saying it's food, are we? We're saying it's bait. Yes. Uh, by the way, we haven't, we haven't actually caught anything on the celebrity meatloaf yet. No, we haven't However, caught anything. However, we've not caught anything on maggot or... Corn. Or corn or, 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 or anything. So it's, got... it's as good as the others so far. I didn't like to admit it, but I'd been up a dead end. Cheers. See you later. Bye. And then, just as I was leaving, something truly amazing happened. Yeah. Alex! Hello, yes. come back! Look at how he's bending. Fair fish. There it is. You've got it, mate. Whoa! Ten. Look at that! It worked! It's they huge! Could it's great. massive! Look at this! Look at it, it's that a giant ten. fish! That is a beauty. It's beautiful! Wow! A proper thing. Oh my god, I've never seen a fish as big as that. You were having no luck on the maggots, the worms, or and anything else. And the celebrity else. meatloaf has done it. Disappoint it. Don't try and squeeze it. Just balance okay. it if it has to think back. Keep your fingers. Okay, yeah. The celebrity meatloaf comes through with the goods. A beautiful tench. Can you take it off me now? Because I'm worried it's going to start flipping. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice one.
Bishop Gadsden. Celebrity meatloaf was clearly a remarkable product. At least fish seem to think so. I was on my way to Denmark, where, due to rather more lax animal welfare regulations, pork is very cheap to produce, making it home to 40% of the pigs that end up in UK piggy products, including Celebrity Meatloaf. The makers of Celebrity Meatloaf had already let me in on some interesting information. The luncheon meat product that is not considered to be of high quality in some parts of Europe is considered a delicacy in Okinawa. Hmm? A delicacy. Okinawans being fans of MRM was fairly momentous news because the Okinawans are a special people. Okinawans are known for their longevity. Individuals live longer on this Japanese island than anywhere in the world. Now, I'm sure they weren't attempting to imply any link between MRM and longevity, but the whole Japan thing had given me inspiration as to how Mr. Riley and Tulip, the celebrity meatloaf manufacturers, could link up. My appointment was with Rune, the celebrity meatloaf publicity man, the man who I was sure could tell me everything I needed to know. So, what do you know about celebrity meatloaf? Tell me about the idea behind it or the, the, the target market, the, you know, what's the, what's the thought there? I'm afraid I can't tell you much about the, 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 the target market for, for this product, actually, because uh, it's, it's a very old product. It was launched in uh, 1960. And, really? Uh, this is not a brand that we do a lot to market. It's a low price, yeah. very low price brand. But as long as there is a, a demand for this product, yeah. yes, then we're selling it. So basically, these poor quality things are aimed at the poor. They're aimed at, at, at the people who, who choose to buy those products. I must admit, it, it would never be one of my own personal favorites right. because that's the way I choose. But we are also have you tried it? Have you have you tasted it? Yeah, I have tasted it, and and it's, I mean, it's it's fine. It's it's safe to eat. And yes. Oh no, no, it's, no, no, it's no safe. Problem. No, it's not poisonous. It, 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 but it's stuff that would normally be, you know, discarded. Then you're sort of making the most of the of the waste. No, I, I wouldn't call it waste. It's a, it's, a, it's a way that you can use technology to get the meat that you, that you couldn't get out before. It was time to make my proposal. I've got some ideas for, for, for Riley's to use Celebrity Meatloaf in products that would appeal both to, to people in the UK, the younger, trendier uh, market, and, and let's face it, they're on a budget, um, and also over in, uh, in Japan. I've, I've actually taken the liberty of, of mocking up a presentation pack. What I'm thinking is Riley's Celebrity Meatloaf Sushi. This is a great way of relaunching Celebrity Meatloaf. Can I have a, a piece? Yes, please it's do. A, and it uh, has been uh, chilled and so on. It has. What do you think? That's okay. Just when I thought things were going really well, they suddenly weren't. It's not a, a new idea. Really? So it has been done believe, for, for I can't years? I believe it. It was time to face the truth. I thought Mr Riley could be a player in the cheap meat market, but they had it all sewn up. No matter what rubbish I thought up, it was already on sale. And in this case, it even had its own bizarre advert. <laughs> it looks exactly the same as our sushi. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I was a bit disappointed. But what I couldn't stop thinking was, if Celebrity Meatloaf was so great and non-poisonous, why weren't the Danes selling it to themselves? But it, you know, it's nice of the Danes to uh, collect together all their leftover bits of pork and uh, put them in tins and sell them to economically disadvantaged people in the UK. Uh, so, you know, that's nice. For some reason, Britain appeared to be a welcoming home for less than meaty meat products from abroad. And maybe that reason is the Food Standards Agency. I wanted to talk to them, but they refused, saying they thought I was going to be too negative. And then it came to me, there was a positive side to all this. Yes, the lax regulations of the Food Standards Agency were bad news for human health, but it was great news for animals. The FSA didn't stand for the Food Standards Agency, it stood for the Federation for Saving Animals. I thought I should give them my support. Um, we can't write shit. What? We're not allowed to write shit. Why not? We're the BBC who are expected to maintain certain that's, standards. That's what, you know, that's the, that's the point we're making. You know, by eating this shit, you can save animals. We've been told yeah. we're not allowed to say shit, I'm afraid. I soon had some supporters who were right behind me. 
and four-legged. Well, actually, one was two-legged, but you get the point. Hello, little animals. Hello. Hello. Well, uh, thanks for coming along, uh, you three. C can you pay? Can you pay attention, please? Can you look? I'm talking to you now. Come on. Now stop it. Now, I want you to behave yourselves. This is a very important mission we're on. These people have been very kind to you by uh, allowing us to to use very few animals in our meat products, and I'd appreciate it if you uh, looked your best, uh, smiled, didn't make any unusual noises, and. If you must go to the toilet, can you be discreet about it, please? On the count of three, let me hear you say, Yeah! One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> he did it. He actually did it. <laughs> Steady. Steady. Hello, we'd like to say thank you to the Food Standards Agency for your rolls on meat products. Thank you. It's been a revelation to Mr. Riley's brand. Uh, we've been able to uh, make a, a very small amount of meat go a very long way indeed. 47% beef burgers inspired. If you think about it, each cow makes twice the number of burgers. And by using fewer bits of meat, we can use fewer animals. And these animals here today are grateful. They were saved from a slaughterhouse. We were making some chicken Kievs. We didn't need that much chicken, but we were delighted to be able to do it all within the regulations and uh, claim the skin and the fat as meat. So 10% meat became 19% meat. Uh, thanks guys. And I'd like to say on behalf of uh, Anthony, Trixie and Cl what's, what's the other one called? Clarissa. Uh, thank you. They've been they're having a lovely day out in London today that they wouldn't have been able to have if the Food Standards Agency regulations were a little bit tighter. Uh, so, thanks again. Give I thought my cuddly little friends might have got the FSA running out for a chat, but then I realised why it wasn't working. They weren't in there. They were actually stood behind me, apparently waiting for a bus. But they, but we have already asked them, yeah. and they said that they didn't want to speak to us because they thought we, we were going to be negative. But you know, we've got a positive. Not at all. I mean, we, we always talk to the media wherever we can. So well, that's, just that's, that's not what we told. We, you know, so we just come down on the off chance, hoping that we could possibly have a chat with somebody while we were here, just for five minutes. You know. Again, you have to go through the formal channels rather than. Okay. Well, I think we're oh, we're, we're sort of going in circles yeah. on it because we've well, tried all that. I can't win, can I? It's a catch twenty-two. We're really trying to. Trying to Really to oh. We're really trying to be helpful, honestly, if you come and speak to Well, could you be helpful it? and just take that in? And yeah. you, uh, honestly, you know. I, I can't accept anything on behalf of the FSA. Uh, sure, again, I'll okay. just show you. It's, it's kind of like a, a mark to show uh, that we could put on our products to say it was animal friendly because we would reduce the amount of meat to the bare minimum uh, again, and turn it into a positive. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm afraid I'm not accepting that. Oh, okay. So I've got to make a move. Thank you. Good boy, good boy, come on. Maybe FSA didn't stand for the Federation of Saving Animals. Maybe it didn't stand for anything at all. The poor had already, perhaps unintentionally, jumped on board my saving animals by eating shit bandwagon. It was time to see if anyone else was prepared to eat it. And, uh, we're here at the um, Henley Cordon Bleu uh, Food Festival, which showcases good quality food. We're showing off the latest range of uh, Mr Riley's recipes, trying to get across our ethos of uh, not wasting things. Um, hopefully that'll go down well with the punters. Shit. Try some pata negra for a change. Pata negra? Si. Just... What, what is pata negra? Pata negra, that's the wild thing, it's organic pig. Oyster now? Yeah. <laughs> The sophisticated world of Pata Negra and oysters was about to meet the world of Mr. Riley. With our There's Nothing Fishy About Our Sushi Celebrity Meatloaf Sushi, our 10% chicken, I mean 19% chicken, Chicken Kiev, and the hearty goodness of our 47% beef beef burger. Oh, that's great. Is that how you spell recipes? Um, no. With a P-I-E, eco recipes. We'll see if we get any strong reactions and act accordingly. And to get the well-to-do to eat like the poor, I had the ultimate ingredient, as practised by all good food manufacturers, 
the Eco Spin. We've got some eco recipes, eco in the sense of economy and ecological in the terms of sort of trying to reduce the impact on the environment. We're not using as many animals in the production. Now this is mainly mechanically recovered meat. It's almost like a byproduct of the pig, so you're not using as many pigs, you're not spending the money on the feed and the transportation, all that sort of thing. We're doing economy with an ecological bent. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice chicken, a nice friendly organic... Free range no, chicken, no, no, no. What the, the, the philosophy is we want to try and reduce the consumption of chickens. Chicken fat is no good, is it? No, I mean, you, you know, a, a, a diet high in fat is yeah. obviously bad for you, isn't it? But it means that, you know, the, uh, the environmental impact of, of, of chicken farming is reduced because we are effectively using fewer chickens. Yes, yes, I know you're using fewer chickens. It wasn't long before I realised what EcoSpin does. Okay. It works! <laughs> Very different to having it with, with fish. Uh, do you like it? Do you like yes, it? Yes, very pleasant. Delicious. To be honest, some kebs are a bit, a bit dry. That's how I prefer, the, prefer yes, it with yes. more succulent. Yeah, with yeah. the fat. But it's quite moist throughout the situation. What are you thinking? What's, what's the taste, the flavour? Come great, on. Great flavour. Yeah? Yeah, fantastic flavour. Very good idea. So I'd reached a conclusion. For years, the FSA had allowed manufacturers to fill whole ranges of food with very little meat and lots of fat, skin and other crap to sell to the financially challenged. But I now knew it was an inspired policy. It saved animals. It saved the planet. And ultimately, we're a nation that deep down quite likes the taste of complete rubbish. Well, it's safe to say I'm a veggie now. Britain's really disgusting food is back next Monday at nine. Next up on BBC Three, there's another chance to see tonight's EastEnders. Enders.